University on elements of electromagnetics in wireless system design. It is a pleasure to introduce Professor Sarkar. He is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Santa Cruz University, USA. His current research interests deal with numerical solutions of operator equations arising in electromagnetics and signal processing with applications to system design. He obtained one of the best solution awards in May 1977 at the Rome Air Development Center Spectral Estimation in Workshop. He has received many more awards. He is the past president of IEEE AP Society. He received the Medal of uh, Friend of the City of uh, Ferran, France in 2000. He doesn't need actually any introduction. He is uh, one of the legends, living legends of uh, Antenna Propagation Society and he has contributed immensely in the development in this particular subject. So I request Professor Sarkar to start his talk. Okay, good morning everybody. It's not coming in. Or it's coming on the other side. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is relevance of electromagnetics in system design. I'm looking for the people who said electromagnetics is a tough subject, difficult to teach, too many equations. I don't see none of these people here. And it turns out this talk is more related to them because the reason electromagnetics is such a headed subject because those of us who teach electromagnetics have done really a lousy job teaching electromagnetics to the student. Actually Maxwell who did all those was a physicist. He was a mathematician. And People should read his book, particularly the preface, where he said he didn't want to introduce mathematics till he went through all of Faraday's experiment. You have to understand, neither Faraday nor Hemsal went to even college. So I want to talk to these people who say electromagnetics is a highly mathematical branch, this and that, all these sorts of silly things which actually produces bad effect on the students. So, firstly, as I am going to show you by through several examples why electromagnetics is relevant in system design. First thing to do, all of us are electrical engineers, right? So you know something about electricity. When you throw the switch, the light comes on. So, how does the energy flow in the US? And of course, these gurus of electromagnetics who say this is difficult stuff will tell you, oh, these are the electrons. The electrons flow in the US and these electrons give you the energy flow. And of course, if you are doing DC, then of course, the velocity of the electron flow would be determined by the DC voltage. But now we use AC. AC means you have a positive cycle, the electrons go this way. On the other half cycle, when the cycle is negative, the electrons come back. So the electrons never leave the switch. So you should ask your teacher, those who teach electromagnetics, how does the energy flow? Because the electrons never actually leave the plug. And that's why electromagnetics comes in, because it was Maxwell who showed energy doesn't flow through the silly electrons. Energy flows through the fields, the electric and the magnetic fields. And they do not reside inside the wire, but they are outside the wire and they travel at the speed of light carrying the energy. That's the basis of electromagnetics. And you should ask your teacher, exactly to explain, how does energy flow? This is the 
fundamental basis of electromagnetic theory. And so, this is the first example. And of course, it turns out that even in DC, the flow is very small of a few meters per second. You can actually walk faster than that. This is the velocity of the flow of electrons in the wires when you apply a DC voltage. But when you have an AC voltage, on the positive half cycle, 110 volt, the electrons go only 0.2 micron, and the negative half cycle come back 0.2 micron, so the electrons never leave the switch. This is the first example. The second example, why electromagnetic is relevant, and I know some people utter about printed circuits, this law, that law. Well, everybody has heard about Moore's law. What happened to Moore's law? How come nobody talks about it? Why has the clock speed for the chips has remained at 3.2 to 3.5 gigahertz for the last five years? What happened to Moore's law? Well, it's very deep inside the ground. Why? Because they did not recognize that the electrons can only flow at the speed of light. Nothing can flow faster than the speed of light except in your dreams. And this is why Musla went out of business. Because if you take one nanosecond, if the clock speed is gigahertz, how much does light go? A foot. 0.3 meters. That's all. That's the maximum. But then you cannot travel at the velocity of light. Energy generally travels about 100 of the velocity of light. So which is roughly 0.3 millimeter. It's almost impossible to get synchronization on your chip with that accuracy. That's the end of Moore's law. It's gone. Done. Another one is coming in that some people utter, which is 5G, 4G, all these things. Well, these are the swan songs of communication engineering. The swan song is an allegory. It turns out the fable is apparently before a swan dies, it gives a beautiful song. That's it. And so a swan song means that's the end. And 5G is essentially is the swan song. Maybe they can go to 5 and a half G. Why? You will see in a minute. But the major problem is the reason Moore's law 5G will be history because they do not understand the principle of electromagnetics. You know, everybody talks about channel capacity. And here is the fallacy. You know, in the ancient days, information, mail, used to be carried on horseback, right? So how much, how many messages can you send to a mailman who is traveling on horseback? Well, as many mailbacks as you can give to the mailman, the mailman will carry it. Unfortunately, that's not the limiting factor. The limiting factor that nobody pays attention to is the horse. How much weight can the horse carry? That's the limiting factor of your message. Here, the mailman is lying on this coding 5G, 6G, infinite G, all these hocus pocus that they talk about. But nobody talks about electromagnetics, which is the velocity of the energy flow, which is the horse. Just like the Moose law, the horse will dig up the grave for the communication people just wait a couple of years. You saw all these people talk about MIMO. 
that same thing holds. Why? Well, how did wireless communication start? Basically, they wanted to do space division multiple axis, right? They wanted to do beam forming. They want to point a beam along a desired user and put a null along the desired, along the undesired users. They have been uttering this nonsense for the last 30 years. Where is beam forming now? They want to do beam forming at 26 gigahertz. How can you believe that? When they could not form beam forming for the last 20 years. Why? Because an antenna has some fundamental basic properties. And unfortunately, the people who design these antennas, build these antennas for the communication people are not familiar with it. And you will see why that comes out. So the next thing that I am going to talk about is uh, maximum power transfer versus efficiency. You know, one of the, again, things that you hear in the microwave area and the electromagnetic area is a misnomer it's called maximum power transfer. I wish they knew what they were talking about. When you buy a heater for your home, do you consider maximum power transfer? No. It's the efficiency. How much money you have to pay? Why don't you use the same concepts when you design an antenna? Again, because those of us who teach electromagnetics, you know, antennas name has been taken in vain. Unfortunately, we are not aware of the properties of antenna. And here is an example what's wrong with my work. You see, you have one transmitter that's giving out 100 watt per liter square. As this antenna gives out waves, it's going to radiate. There is an interferer which has an energy of only 1 watt per meter square. 1% of the power density of this. Now as these waves propagate, there is going to be constructive and destructive interference. So the question is, what will be the variation of the power density in space? Is it going to be 100 plus minus 1? What do you think? Yes? No? Maybe? Well, this is the basic fundamental of electromagnetic theory. What's happening? Is it 100 plus minus 1? Yes or no? That's the problem. Am I to accept that you have not heard anything about electromagnetic theory? You are not electrical engineers? Are you going to give me that wrong impression? What? At least somebody must have some voice. You are laughing. What do you think? Why not? That's an intelligent guy. The reason is because in electrical engineering convolution superposition applies to convolution. Superposition does not apply to correlation. Power is correlation. Here we are talking about power. Superposition does not apply to power, even though this is the basic bread and butter of communication engineering, signal processing and so on, you cannot add power. In microwave also, you do add power. You cannot include power. Of course, it's a free country, you can do whatever you want, 
But power is not a principle superposition that applies in electrical engineering. It's the superposition of the fields. So if you want to find superposition of the fields, E square, which is square root of 100, plus minus square root of 1, square, and that will give you your variation. So 10 plus minus 1 is 11 and 9. If you square that, it's 121 and 81, which means 1% interference is going to give you a 40% variation in the output. So, I do not see how an intelligent person would use an interferometric situation. Oh, that's good. That use an interferometric situation to use multiple antennas. It's suicidal to use multiple antennas. That's the problem. Now, the next item is efficiency and maximum power transfer. And all these antennas people, all they do is take a software code, of course not written by them, otherwise they would know what's inside there, and generate some numbers without really basically understanding what exactly those numbers mean. All they do is take an antenna, do the S11 and the thing that is done. But the property of an antenna is that it's device which radiates electromagnetic energy. What is radiation? Is the far field. An antenna does not have a field in the near field of an antenna. This is the basic fundamental property. In the far field, the fields are transverse, the shape of the field pattern is independent of the distance. In the near field, uh, which is close to the antenna, the power is complex. Now, if you take your textbook for a dipole, you can write the vertical component of the electric field analytically, and you will see that this function does not have a zero. So, even a dipole, which all of them will show a figure of eight pattern showing the nulls. You see, it does not have a null. The null only appears in the far field. In the near field, the antenna does not have a null. So, if you take a half wave dipole at one gigahertz, if you go away two n square over lambda, where L is 15 centimeter half wavelength, you go 0.15 meter, 15 centimeter away from the antenna, you are in the far field of the antenna and you have a pattern. But now, if you look outside the window, that's not how the wireless antennas are deployed. They are deployed on top of a 20 meter tower. The question is, how does the antenna pattern look when the dipole is deployed on top of a 20 meter tower? That will give you the answer. Well, you would not find any data that any of these communication people will be able to tell you. That's the problem. If you take a half wave dipole antenna in free space, only quarter is shown, you get a nice figure of a pattern. But when you put the antenna on top of a 20 meter tower, this is how the antenna pattern looks. If these people use their software code or even just go outside and do some basic fundamental measurement of an antenna pattern, you will say that this is absolutely useless antenna pattern. You cannot do beamforming with such an antenna pattern. This is why all these people have been harping on beamforming space division multiple axis for the last 30 years and it has not occurred because these people do not know anything about basic property of an antenna. As simple as that. So, electromagnetics is essential.
potential if you want to build a system. Otherwise, you will have this half-baked system and they don't work. And the people don't know why they don't work. And unfortunately, the people, those of us who teach electromagnetics, do not tell the context of what we are teaching to the student just presents a mumbo jumbo of mathematics, confuse the student. So when the interesting part comes, the student leaves the subject never to come back again. See, even if you take a reflector antenna, which is a very high end antenna, which has very high main beam and low side lobes, see near the antenna, the antenna pattern has not formed even for this structure. As you go further away, 2D square over lambda, the beam is formed. So if you want to do beam forming, you need to do it in the far field. So it's just a simple intellectual exercise. If you have an antenna on top of a 20 meter tower, where does the far field start? So that you can do the beam forming. Well, physics tells us if there is a source, there is an image 20 meters below the ground. So your aperture is actually 40 meters to 40 square at 1 gigahertz, which is 0.3, gives you a value of approximately 10 kilometers. That means if you go away 10 kilometers, that's where you can form the beam, which is outside the cell. It costs more to put the tower than to put the antenna. But then, that's how it is done, because the electromagnetics people do not tell the other side what's going on. Because that themselves, we, those of us who teach electromagnetics, do not teach the context to the student to illustrate why it doesn't make sense. Why good farming has not worked in 30 years. And it's never going to work, and that's why I say, is the swan song has started. It's just a matter of time, just like the Moore's law will disappear, these people will disappear too. Another thing, a misconception that people have is efficiency and maximum power transfer. We think as possible that maximum power transfer is the way to go. No. If that's the way to go, how come when you buy gadgets for your house, you do not pay attention to the maximum power transfer? Because it's not the best way to go. And if you know your RLC circuit very well, particularly resistive circuits, and I hope that electromagnetics have not let you forget the basic electrical engineering. If you have 50 ohms and 50 ohms and if you take one watt as a source connecting these two 50 ohms you will have half watt on every 50 ohms. Well, that's where the microwave people stop. But let's go a step further. I want to change the load impedance to 100 ohms. And I want to still provide a 1 watt input. Will the load receive more power or less power? What do you think? It will receive more power. If you put 1 watt, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, you can work out the simple loop equations and you will see the load will get majority of the power. So then don't you think it is silly to confine yourself to maximum power transfer because again we do not provide the context. In maximum power transfer they do not say that your input power is fixed. Input power can increase as much as you want 
And so you can use maximum power transfer, get something from the power. But if your input power is fixed, then the higher the impedance, load impedance, the greater is the source. Next, let's go to the antenna case that you have seen a lot of things talked about antennas. Now let me ask a simple question. This is how antennas needs to be matched. You have a simple antenna, a half-wave dipole antenna, which is roughly about 100 ohms. And the source impedance is 50 ohms. We have the same source. So we consider case A, where the antenna is connected just to the source without any matching. Next, we consider case B, where we have a conjugate match, so it's now matched directly to 50 ohms. That's case B. Case C, we just put a capacitor so that it cancels the reactive part, so the input impedance of the antenna is 93 plus J44, so we want to put a capacitor to cancel the input reactance, just have real power. Now, I put the same power to all three cases. Which antenna do you think is going to radiate the most film? Case A? How many for case A? Nobody? How many for case B? One. Two. At least two people is thinking. How many do you think for case C? You are the most intelligent person. You should teach antennas, not other people. Why? Because you do not deal again with maximum power transfer. Turns out, when you have the reactants matched, the efficiency is 65%. If you do matched load, it's only 50%. You are wasting 50% of the power. So you can talk about conjugate matching in receiver side where it may have some usefulness that we will see in a minute, but the power quantities are low, so it really doesn't matter. But for transmission, you should never ever consider conjugate matching. If you do, you do not understand basic electromagnetics, I'm sorry to say. And this is the problem, that we do not provide context to the students. What is the relevance of this subject? Just write some mathematical mumbo jumbo that does not solve the problem. And if you look at the electric field radiated, you will see the reactants matched, has the maximum field, and then the Mesh case is the lowest one, it doesn't work. And if you take a three quarter wavelength antenna, it has a higher efficiency than a 0.65 wavelength antenna, than a half wavelength antenna. So the moral of the story is that there are no power amplifiers in the literature or in this world. It's a misnomer that this microwave and electromagnetics people have created about a power amplifier. You can either amplify voltage or current. Then you cannot amplify power. It's a meaningless quantity. But historically that has been used. And again, errors are continued to be made. So the moral of the story is as you design and amplify high input impedance, low output impedance. That's the rule of thumb. Now, unmatched transmitting scenario. Suppose I have got four antennas of different lengths. 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, and 0.5 wavelength. Well, the question is, if we excite,
the same voltage and balance the power which one will radiate the most. And of course, the half wavelength will radiate the most power because it's better matched because of this input impedance. And so, if you look at the power, the half wavelength radiates more field than electrically small antennas. But now, let's conjugate match all these antennas. If we do that, which one do you think is going to radiate the most? Any suggestions? All of them will reduce the, radiate the same power. So, the moral of the story is you have to conjugately match it. And if you do the same thing for the transmitted scenario, for the receiving scenario, if you do the same thing, you see, of course, the electrically small antenna will receive the least power. But if you conjugately match the antenna, as you see, they will receive exactly the same power even though they are electrically small. Now, the problem is, I do not know how many of you have heard or have seen a prehistoric transistor radio. It had an antenna and the transistor radio operated from 500 kilohertz to roughly a megahertz and you could hear on the other side of the world. Nobody talked about fading or any of these other silly concepts that you hear nowadays why signals cannot propagate through walls, buildings, all these hocus pocus. This transistor radio worked. There was no problem and it cost much less than any of those expensive silly gadgets. Why? It worked beautifully and the Qualcomm people got rid of it because they didn't understand the basic principles of an antenna. You see the first stage is the tuner. If you conjugately match an antenna, that's the best you can do. You cannot do anything better ever. Doesn't matter what people will say. Now if you go to the uh, Qualcomm's patent, they have now filed a patent for <coughs> called multiband antennas. Now they are finding out what is the job of the tuner. So once they have now got the patent, you will see the tuner coming back. Another problem that you will see these wireless people blood on without knowing what they were doing is near far. Apparently there is a power problem, they have to change the power if it is the station is near the receiver or not. And again, the transistor radio had no problem because they had what was called a volume control. What the volume controller did was a feedback from the audio stage to the amplifier of the RF stage, so which controlled the RF gain of the RF amplifier. Now again, Qualcomm has found the pattern. They are beginning to see the light of the day, and without the help of the electromagnetic people, I do not know what the electromagnetic people have been doing for all these years, at least not educating the right people, and it didn't work. Now you can go to the market and get this junk, the three idiots call, pay hundred times more and they don't work. And you see, here is the fallacy of Maimo. Maimo started out by saying, oh, we want to do multiple reception. And of course, as I showed you, using multiple antennas is a stupid idea. I'm sorry about this raw work, but that's the one to explain it. Why? Because you saw 1% change produces 40%. So then they started saying, oh, what we do, we compare the output from each antenna 
Whichever is the maximum, we add to that. Well, that is not the Mahimo and Keller. That's the one they can do because that's how they can fool people, particularly the electromagnetic people, to solve this, to sell this junk to them at an expensive price. All they have to do, just put one antenna and for heaven's sake, match it. All problems are solved. Okay, next thing is ultra wide band. Everybody talks about ultra wide bands. But nobody talks about century bandwidth antennas. We talk about antennas that have a bandwidth 100 to 1. For example, this antenna, if you do a simulation and measurements, it goes from 300 megahertz to 30 gigahertz, actual thousand. So you don't need to design and write a thesis, a one antenna, this band, this band, multiple band, you can design antennas that cover a century bandwidth, if you know how an antenna works. This is, for example, century bandwidth circularly polarized antenna that has been in existence for 50 years. Unfortunately, it was classified for some time. Now the Air Force has, because I think 50 years was over, so they published it and all you need to find a phase balancer that can create 90 degree phase shift over a century value. And the pattern, as you see, are very good. This is another century bandwidth antenna. And uh, the, our goal, when people have problems with designing strong antennas, we help them out. These are resistors that we are putting. And with these resistors, as you see, we get an impulse. These impulses can go from picoseconds to nanoseconds. And uh, the electromagnetic compatibility people say that when their antenna radiates, everybody can hear. Because if you transmit a megavolt pulse, and if it is wet outside, because the dielectric breakdown of the air is changing. Some of the other things that I am going to show you relevance to electromagnetics. Well, this, for example, you all know as the Mars rover. Now, the main communication is done by a VHF antenna. Can you point out what the VHF antenna is located? Because this is not a regular ground plane. You have to not only place the antenna and make sure you get the good coverage over the entire angle and this band. As you see, the best position of the antenna is right here, that this is the VHF antenna. Even though it's near an edge, it provides uh, excellent coverage and we know it works. Another example that uh, Dr. and uh, Professor Christopher would like to see. This is a 1700 12 slot, narrow band slot antennas. These are used, as you know, but not well known otherwise, for extremely low side low antenna arrays. You cannot measure the side lobe of these because they can go from anywhere from 60 to 90 dB. Measurements you can only do up to 50 dB because the sources do not go beyond that. You need to use a good numerical analysis code and you need to optimize the 17, 12 slots simultaneously their orientation, their depth of cut, and where they are located, not only on the same waveguide, but also in the area. Once you do the proper optimization, as you see, this antenna has a side lobe level of uh, 
almost 70 to 80, some places 90 degrees. And you can see it when you plot that 3D pattern, you see this goes from here to green level, most of it is green and blue, and that clearly shows that the leakage at the other side is very low. Satellite antennas again, you can do cluster, but the main thing that you need to do in a system design, not only the antenna, but the radar, and also what the effect is there on the structure. And here you see that the rocket has an effect on the side of the This is another early warning system radar. Uh, this is the E3D uh, and, uh, antenna. The E3D is the early warning system of the Navy, US Navy. And this is a sandwich radar. Uh, there is an antenna that sits inside it and we would like to know what is the optimum location. How are you placed above the uh, structure of the aircraft, what position, and so on. And uh, these are the ribs that stay inside the radon to give it stability. And there is a IFF two antennas, and the goal was to find out because these are also low side curve antennas, what is the effect of the ribs. And here is one example that I can show that uh, Hobbies is our simulator, electromagnetic simulator, it can do parallel optimization, and this is the measurement. And you see that numerical analysis is very close to uh, the measurement. This is a 112 array Vivaldi that the Navy was interested in, that you need to analyze the every detail of the aircraft to find out the site. So our site business is in China, that now all the top five supercomputers in the world are in China. So each supercomputer has about like 200,000 processors with petabyte of memory, hundreds, thousands of hard disks. How do you know the computers work? So we were, we provided a solution to them that you run the electromagnetic analysis code, you analyze some of the slotted array, and if you get the same answer, by taking portions of the computer and getting the same answer, you know your computer is working. So the Shanghai supercomputer became our first customer and if you go to their Chinese website, they do not update the electrical and in English website that they claim that the Hobbies code is the only code that worked without any problem and used all their supercomputer. This has been on their website for the last 10 years. Also, you know, people talk about ultra wide band. You can do ultra wide band with a bicone and a horn. And if you transmit, for example, a one point, uh, roughly about 12 picosecond rise time pulse, you see the pulse and feel it here, receive it here, this pulse. You see, this is what it propagates when they are separated by one meter. And you would agree that there is absolutely no distortion at all. So I do not know what all these people are doing when they talk about ultra wideband transmission without any distortion. And this is how the waveform look if you separate five meters. Five meters, as you see, there is practically no distortion. Again, ultra wide band is a trivial problem. If you understand how an antenna operates, period. You can also do other things like the FCC has this mask and you want to create a broadband pulse. 
following the FCC mask. The key, if you want to transmit a pulse, it has to be finite. You know, all these time domain code, oh, which are very popular here, people have paid a fortune paying for this code and they are proud to talk about it. But these silly people don't understand that the excitation pulse that is used on this time domain code goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if you apply a finite pulse, you cannot use those codes to see what comes out. You cannot get a finite pulse and it has to be linear phase and you see uh, it doesn't, the input and the output is very similar. Uh, I just want to close with the last slide. I said, read a pretty strong statement that the communication people, Swan Song, has started. Why? Because they are not very familiar with Shannon's paper. Just like electromagnetics people talk about Maxwell's equation. Talk, 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 talk. The communication people talk about Shannon. Talk, 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 talk. But they don't understand exactly what Shannon did. This is the abstract of his paper. It's very important for people to read that there, what Shannon is talking about, the sequence of codes for the channel of increasing transmission approaches C and the probability of error in decoding at the receiving point approaches zero. Which means that to Shannon, the transmitter was not an RF amplifier. Transmitter which operates on the message in some way to produce a signal suitable for transmission over the channel. In telephony, this operation conflicts are merely changing the sound pressure, which means it's doing coding at RF. And it talks about pulse code modulation. And to Shannon, the receiver is the decoder. So Shannon was doing digital transmission. Right now, all that junk that comes out in wireless system, it's not digital transmission. There is coding. The coding is in the basement. What comes out is an analog signal at RF. You, they do not have an A2D that can do at 3 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz. So, therefore, to talk about channel capacity, simply meaningless and this is the problem why things are not going to work just to show what Shannon said contribution according to Viterbi Viterbi said that Shannon's contribution made satellite communication and GPS possible in GPS signal nobody complains about fading or in the satellite signal because in GPS, you have a gigabit code that you sent out and then you do a pulse compression and receive it. And so VTRB talks about digital modulation and if you do digital modulation, you get the solution. And when Shannon was alive, people were doing all sorts of Mickey Mouse things. So Shannon wrote an opera called the bandwagon. See, information theory has in the last few years become some, something of a scientific bandwagon. And you can go and read Shannon's sarcastic remark. The best analysis was done by Nosek. He was the president of the circuit theory. And this is what is meaningful. Electromagnetic field theory provides the physics of radio communication while information theory approaches the problem from a purely mathematical point of view. While there is a law of conservation of energy in physics, there is no such law in information theory. 
Consequently, when in information theory reference is made, as it frequently is to terms like energy, power, noise, or antennas, it's by no means guaranteed that their use is consistent with the physics of the communication system. That's the fundamental flaw. And I wish those of us who teach electromagnetics should at least get this right and not say silly statements like it's too mathematical, too complex, students don't like it. This is why students should study because this is the only way to design a physical system. And Gabor says the same thing. One less communication system are due to the generation, reception and transmission of electronic signals. Therefore, wireless systems are subject to the general laws of radiation and not of statistical stuff. Communication theory has up to now been developed mainly along mathematical lines, taking for granted the physical significance. But communication is the transmission from one system to another, and its communication theory should be considered as a part of physics. And then Gabor ends with uh, saying that you need to understand Maxwell's point in theory. So all I have talked about is basically to say that communication theory provides an approximate analysis and has nothing to do with the realization of the system and with electromagnetic theory you get uh, the basic understanding. And if you want to find out more, you can go and read our paper in the Aerospace and the Electronic System magazine that was published in 2016, which discusses more about that, because we thought that uh, instead of trying to teach it to the electromagnetics people, who are difficult to teach anything new, the better off telling to the communications people who want at least makes an attempt to study the subject. Thank you for your attention. I will have to take two minutes for Dr. Christopher. So the floor is open for taking maybe two questions. Two quick questions because we are already short of time. Yes. Sir, first of all, I should say that it's a very nice, interesting and inspiring talks. And I have a sort of simple query or kind of suggestion from a scholar like you. So whenever we try to teach a subject like antenna or microwave in the UG level, so can you please suggest that how to start means those kind of things? We have books. We have written 10 books on the topics. Read our papers on the hydrogen transactions. Go quietly explore. Find it out. The, what I have talked about that will come from the sky. It's out there in the published literature and has been there for the last 15 years. All you have to do is study. If your advisors do not tell you, the main job of an advisor is to guide the student, tell them where additional information can be obtained. And for PhD and Masters, is to go to IEEE. That's why you belong to IEEE. IEEE has explored, which lists everything that has been published so far. You put in a subject and it tells you the various papers that have been published on that topic. You don't need to be an IEEE member either. You can just go to www.iteplexplore.com, get a free, it's a free service, put in advanced search, you put the name or a subject name, give multiple choice, and look what has been done. Period. Done. Thank you, sir. But that's not what we like to like these people do. They have been using 40 years thing, but the uh, papers are falling down. Just write equation after equation. 
They need to tell the students who would like to be explored and study about the subject. Any, any other query from PhD students, research scholars? Yes. Hi, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask you that uh, you told that uh, MIMO and UWB are swan songs. So, I didn't say I am UWB. Uh, yes, UWB has its own reputation. So, uh, according to you, what are the reasons? Well, let me tell you, give you my rational explanation. You have quoted me right, but for the wrong reason. Why MIMO is a swan song? Initially, MIMO stated that they can do beam farming. Well, that didn't work. Then they started deploying, selling on this radio shack and so on, multiple antennas. Why they did that? They take the output from each antenna, have a comparator, check which one is the higher voltage and does that. How come the ancient transistor radios used only one antenna? Because they completely match the antenna. So now, if you look at the papers, what they are doing, you already know that multiple special channels is not possible. Only one channel is dominant and that works. So now, they have started doing coding on each channel and transmit a coded signal. But that's not how MIMO started. MIMO started an SDMA, Space Division Multiple Access, because they said time division, frequency division, code division was full. But now, then why are they introducing coding at each channel and then do the processing? This is why MIMO is a swan song. Yes, sir. So, what are the recent trends? Uh, which you approve of, uh, which would be beneficial in the future. Go back to a shop, old shop, prehistoric shop, get an old transistor radio. Open it up and see how an RF system should be designed. <laughs> you have the antenna, you have a tuner. And you see what band the tuner tuned the antenna to do what? Bandwidth. Same antenna. Just take prehistoric antenna or a prehistoric radio where the first take was a magic gun. And that will give you more information than, and also. The most important part is the automatic gain control, which was a fantastic feedback mechanism to solve the near and far problem that we talk about wellness complication. You don't have to do power management. That's it. And finally, you need to look at basic principles of electrical engineering. Namely, correlation and convolution. Superposition applies to convolution, which is system response. Power is correlation. Superposition does not apply to power. And finally, whenever you connect sources, all sources are connected in series, not in parallel. Except in MIMO, they are connected in parallel. So whenever any student comes to me and talks about they want to do MIMO, I say, I think this is an excellent idea. I think you should go to a car shop and get two car batteries. Connect them in parallel and show that you can get more power by connecting two batteries in parallel than one battery. But before you do, Increase the, your life insurance and the insurance on your house because you may not need to talk, talk about it because it explode. So, the whole 
system, the paradigm of connecting sources in series doesn't work. All you need to do is go to the computer center where they have a backup battery and you will find that they have got 200 batteries all connected in series. Not in parallel. Yes, sir, thank you. So, uh, for any further discussion and all, we uh, will get a chance to interact with professors after giving breaks. Uh, okay, so with this, we we'll thanks the speaker for the meeting once again. And for the professor, we will have an announcement. Thank you, Dr. Sattva, for your hard earning wisdom in the field of electromagnetics and also for studying fallacies regarding some technology solvers like quantum. Now I request Dr. Professor Dr. S. Sarwan to give a certificate to Dr. Kapan Sattha and also to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Christopher. Thank you. There is a certificate of appreciation and admiration for the great person. Before that, don't you all think that we should give a standing ovation? No, just one more minute. from the audience. Do you know who was this guy? Harrington. Who told Harrington? Mm -hmm. uh, you please meet me. <laughs> Afterwards, I will give a uh, uh, very big uh, memento. Right. Harrington. Harrington, the toughest book. He was his guy. Now, uh, we have next person. Please sit down.